What's up, family? Man, man, man. It's your favorite podcast coming out of Washington County, Michigan. Shout out, Ipsalani. This is Stay in Power. I am one of your hosts, Shane Collins. He, him, his pronouns. Um, My co-host is off with some other business, but they will be back at another point. Um, Man. I want to introduce to y'all some of my favorite people in the whole wide world. Um, been knowing these people, some of them for, you know, going on five years, some of them just a couple years now, but I feel like, I feel like they all, they all been part of the crew. They all been part of the crew for a minute. So love to see you all here. Excited to get this started. Um, would anybody like to start off with some intros? We got, you know, Ashanti. We got M, we got Malik, we got Seattle. So we got Naima. Naima made it back in the building. Naima, I didn't know if they was going to make it back in here. So um, does anybody want to start off with some intros? If not, you know I got it started. I'm going to take that silence as a go-ahead to get myself go. Okay, for sure. So uh, like I said, Shane Collins, see him, his pronouns. I'm 19. I'm a college student. Um, I am a performer. I'm a performer, first and foremost, by title. I'm an actor. I'm a writer. I'm a singer sometimes, you know what I'm saying? Um, I'm a rapper. I am, I'm a spoken word poet. I do a little bit of everything. Um, trying to be, trying to be good in all them facets. So, um, you know, just trying to, trying to impact the world with what I love and then, you know, hopefully, hopefully, uh, make somebody smile. That's, that's all I'm really trying to do. Um, I'm a popcorn it to Malik. Cool. 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 Uh, my name is Malik. Uh, I'm an artist. I think in like almost every shape possible, I guess you could say that. Um, I'm a college student. I'm a people are like you a baby. Um, 18, also a college student. I don't know, man. I like to smile. I just like to talk a lot. Um, I'm a popcorn into a shanty. What's up? What's up? What's up? Um, Ashanti Kenyatta Campbell, uh, performer, writer, lover of music. Um, from Ipsen, not really, but like that's what I'm gonna say because it's home uh, for now. You know, gotta take care of where I am. Um, I'm fast to M. Hey everyone, I'm M. I use they them pronouns. Um, 18, also a college student, um, and I've been with Staying Power since 2019. Um, just very excited to be here, and I'm gonna pass it to Naima. Naima, I use they, them, or she, her, doesn't matter. Um, my favorite spot in Ipsy, I would say, definitely, probably Riverside. That's, that's the, that's the good one. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a poet, my bad. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a poet, Detroit-based poet. That's 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 right. That's about it right there. Um, I I be in stand power. I love it here. All right, I'm gonna go. Um, I'm Ciara. I'm 18. About to turn 19 in a few weeks. I go by she her pronouns, and um, I'm a poet based in Ipsy. Uh, louder than a bomb alumni. Uh. Ann Arbor Ipsy uh, Slam Team poet for 2019. Also, have been a staying power, like, have been involved with staying power since the very beginning. And yeah, uh, also runner up for Youth Poet Laureate for Ipsy and Ann Arbor 2020. Yeah, that's all my accolades. You know, um, but we was talking a little bit about Ipsy. 
Oh uh, man, I think we all just gonna shout out a, a, some, give Ipsy some love and shout out some of our favorite places at Ipsy. Um, anybody, anybody got some something they really want to get off their chest about Ipsy? Something they love? Um, I give props to like Riverside Park because it's like a nice place to go when it's like hot outside or you just want a place to like chill out at. It's not too many people if you go by like the lakeside and if you just like sit there, it's really nice to hear like all the animals and the birds and everything. Um, also want to shout out Got Burger. It's a really um, good burger joint. And it's like open late at night. So whenever you and some friends don't know where to eat at, there's Got Burger for you. Yep. On top of like, uh, I'm just going to talk after that. It's a um, respect out today. They just built a new skate park. And usually, you know, it ain't for skate parks. It ain't usually for everybody. But this one's kind of like, it's in the middle of nowhere, but it's also meant to target kids that couldn't make it out to the path, the, like the, the other skate park. And I like that. Cause I'm one of those, I was one of those, one of them kids. But um, aside from that, probably like uh, oddly enough, like the old paper mill, like the Peninsula Mill. I like being over there. I like hearing the water over there for real. It's really relaxing. It's calm. It's probably like one of my favorite spots. I like, yeah, just, that's probably my favorite spot. That's what's up, Malik. Um, I live by there, and. I, I sometimes go under the bridge at night and I just like chill. Um, I will want to ask you where that skate park is though. Like I need I need addresses. I need I need landmarks. I'm trying to be there. Um, hi, Ashanti. Like I previously said, uh, my favorite part of Ipsy, well, was when I first moved to Ipsy. Uh, I love like West Willow area. I love downtown because that's where I always was. I was either in West Willow, by West Willow, like getting my hair cut by the cow and fillers cuts or going to Cuppies for the first time with my friends. It's really nice around there. We need the ball, man. Um, I just love, like, I just love being in Ipsy, just being so close to like Depot Town and also downtown is super nice, just a nice little walk. Um, um, not too far from my house. So that's always been really nice growing up and just going downtown. Um, and I also just really love Lawn City hand pulled noodles. Um, that's on Washtenaw. Um, and they're just, they're Asian owned and family owned, very good noodles. Um, so if anyone wants to try them out, they're on Washtenaw Avenue. That's too fire. Um, man, I think my favorite part about Ipsy is just, it just, it's just, it's just never not felt like home. Uh, just literally, you know, literally in a sense, just because I've been here all my life, but it's, uh, I just feel like it's so welcoming. Um, and being downtown, it's like, um, it's, it's really so beautiful. It's, it's you know, it's, it's not a huge place and everything, but it's a nice little walk. It's a bunch of shops up the side. Um, and then, you know, around around the holidays, they got the they got the Christmas lights all st- sprinkled down the street lights. And I, I like taking a little drive down there and, uh, you know, being at the uh, I remember being at the, the downtown library going there a bunch when I was little. Um, being at that at that fountain, just watching the fountain and everything, and I just got a lot of memories playing playing on the little uh, books and stuff behind the library. Uh, I just got countless memories over there. Shout out, uh, uh, Gabriel's cheesesteak hoagies. Oh boy, I go crazy on a cheesesteak hoagie. You understand me? Um, but shout out Riverside Park too. Uh, shout out Frog Island. Um, man just it just it just feels like home whether you from here whether you not it feels like home and that's my favorite part about the city um so if anybody has anything else to say all right fantastic so today y'all we want to talk about 
Asian hate and Asian violence. Um, now I know I know this did not happen super recently, but um, um, I think especially the shooting in Atlanta um, sparked a lot of talk about this, um, and it was it kind of just ignited a conversation that should have been had long, long, long ago. Um, and because, you know, we want to, we want to represent for all our people, uh, we want to make sure we spread awareness about it make sure everybody understands what's really going on. Uh, just cause some people might not have the opportunity to have these conversations with friends and family, or they might not be comfortable with it. So we just want to have a safe outlet, uh, for y'all to be able to understand kind of what's going on and everything. So, um, so I'm gonna use the Atlanta shooting as reference. Um, so if y'all don't know what happened, um, a guy drove through Atlanta and he shot eight people, six of which were Asian women. And his excuse for doing so was because he wanted to eliminate temptation. Um, and so I, when, I, when I was doing my research on this, um, that just sounds like a, <laughs> I don't know, that, that's, that doesn't even sound like something you can really uh, grasp um, as, a, as a normal thinking human, I guess. <laughs> um, I guess it really just dehumanized what they were, made them objects. Um, something of a, a a temptation. So I guess like it's their fault that they were a temptation or that he had some type of fetish towards them. Um, and it really, it was just re super dehumanizing. Um, and so what I was seeing was um, a big thing, especially in America about this is because um, America has had a lot of wars with Asian countries. And because of that, um, a lot of times, so just in a general sense, Asia has been looked at as a place to conquer or to be better than or to take over. Um, and then as well into that, um, and before I go any further, I just want to, um, you know, drop a trigger warning for anybody about racial violence. Um, because, you know, this could be hard for some people. So um, it should be hard for everybody. But um, I just want to let y'all know before we go any further. But uh, so um, a lot of times when they were, when GIs were sent into these Asian countries, um, there were places called um, camp towns. And in the camp towns, um, the GIs got involved with sex workers um, over there. And because of that, um, that kind of view, as well as mixing in just like propaganda and, and um, unrealistic, uh, an unrealistic presentation of, or like, unrealistic view of of Asian women um, that were put into like movies and TV and, and, and books and, and, and everything and, and just social media and everything um, they became viewed as more instead of instead of being just people instead of just being human they started being viewed as like different objects. And if they were human, they were like questioned even about their anatomy and if they were different and everything. And that goes back to a lot of uh, how white people view other races, especially back then they thought they were, I guess, literally built different and that their anatomy, they were able to withstand certain things or that they were created to, um, to take on or, be or made or, or be used 
by white people for certain things. It's, it's, it's very, very terrible. Um, but um, so in, in that, they got, they started being viewed as objects. And so when the guy says, um, I was just trying to eliminate temptations and there was outcry because the police disassociated race from uh, how do I say this? They they disassociated they disassociated like race from 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 just the killing and like the two weren't associated or or his 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 feelings or anything towards that weren't because weren't racially motivated as much as they were because of uh it's his own wants um when the two really coincide um and so i uh there's a really great uh article that I read um, and I listened to as well. It was it was just transcripted. Um, but uh it's it's a hard thing to look at because it's it's you know about it, but it's when it's put onto paper like that or or you're just reading about it and it's just like, I don't know. It's it's a conversation that should have been had a long time ago, and it's not that it was never not here. It's just that um, until this point, it, it's kind of sad that it took something as egregious as um, people getting killed in order to start really talking about it. Got any thoughts? I was gonna say uh, most definitely. I like before, as you said, like. <laughs> the the richest history America has or just generally like white people in general is like how racially charged they are and how ignorant they can be but it's also like uh that point that like you saying that made me think of like something I read before I believe it was like a um I think it was the co-founder of AAPI uh but um I think he was saying like I can't tell if like with with everything happening, not everything happening, but with a lot of like the hate crimes increasing just all over the all over the U.S. With them increasing, I can't tell if the the amount of hate crimes has increased or the amount of people like reporting them has increased because it's been like heavily uh, more like it's more under the public eye at the same time to be like things are now becoming like linked that it's racially charged instead of like, oh, man, it was just an attacking and it was like it's kind of ignorant but stupid to think that that's possible but it's it's all the more likely and even with uh on top of like that i want to bring a um uh also just another event like that that i linked as well but like even in um the, the shooting that happened in atlanta uh sorry to speak of it so lightly um and then like there was a there was a tax in san francisco and brutal brutal uh tax in new york but majority of them that that are reported are mostly asian women which is like when you said it earlier, it's kind of, um, I don't know, just kind of like broad light, like, man, this is, this is not okay, obviously, but it's also just, it, it's, it's more of now like numbers are coming to light, but also more events are being reported and such. And now it's like, man, all this happens, but you won't see it happening to like other, you won't see it happening to like white men or anything that's like being, consistently reported or like white cis men or anything in general like that you wouldn't see stuff like that happening it would only be uh towards a minority group and it would only be in like lower areas not lower areas but less populated areas or where crime is like at all time high or supposedly poor areas can i say can i say this it seems you said he wanted to eliminate temptation is that what he said it seems like the privileged has like this fetishization or like they, this kind of concept that 
being attracted to or like in any way for something that they deem is lower is the worst thing ever. And I, I hate the fact that so many, I don't even like privileged people. I think like anyone that you feel like is lower than you, like it's, it's like a mo it's like, you can't, so sorry, I can't even formulate words, but do you get what I'm saying? Like, I'm, it's, it's wild to think that like we're, that someone can dehumanize someone, another person, just because they don't look like them. And the fact that they're attracted to this person or this like idea of this person, this, this <laughs> formulated like fetish that they've created in their minds, they've like, they kind of like sell paint. So they like rage out. They are uh, their form of rebellion to the public, but that's okay to them because it's, they're like lower beings. And I think that's so crazy. Yeah, I just want to jump in and say, like, going back to what Malik was talking about, about the higher number of reported cases, I just had this conversation with my family, like, last week about how we have phones now, and we can record things now, um, and that's, like, it's not because now, in 2021, people are, like, racist, more racist than they have been before, it's just that we can record these things um, and use them as evidence as to what's actually happening like every day. Um, and another thing I was gonna say is like, um, like I've seen, I'm not even gonna say his name, but the, the shooter, the murderer um, in Atlanta, I've seen media saying, blaming it on the sex addiction, um, the sex addiction to Asian women and it is murder. Um, you can acknowledge like, okay, yeah, he killed people he killed these women because of temptation or whatever, um, but it's a hate crime. It's 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 murder. Um, he killed these people um, out of hate and racism. Um, so I just I was so angry when all of those reports came out because I I just saw his name and then it would just be like name comma sex addict um, and not even addressing like murderer. Um, so that was really frustrating. And I just wanted to talk about that because it's not, you can't just blame it on the sex addiction. Um, I just think that's, that's crazy. Um, and we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be um, talking about this man in that way. Um, he should be called out for what he is. Yeah, um, I, I feel like often when, a white person commits commits a, a hate crime or something that can be viewed as terrorism. Um, we start to try to look at all of the variables. Um, so it wasn't just that he killed somebody, but he was mentally unstable or he had a sex addiction. Um, it wasn't anything just straight up murder um, because there's always something underlying um, I guess that's the privilege that they hold is for there to be something underlying, assuming that uh, they couldn't have just killed somebody because it's that's what they were about. Um, and really, stuff like this, like it's, it's systematic. Um, there was um, I was reading it's called the Page Act of 1875. Um, which was even before the uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act, but this targeted specifically, or, or well, more East Asian women, um, and it was just like, and and again, like these are all laws put in place by by white men and people who feel threatened or feel some obligation to uh, continue with or feed into propaganda, um, just because of war efforts or anything like that. It, it, it's stuff that just gets ingrained in our minds and stuff that we have to unlearn. But this thing basically stated that, um, and it, it basically, it, uh, it, 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 it,
Um, I believe it prohibited interaction with East Asian women because they were all viewed as prostitutes and they were even, they even said stuff as far as like, they carry different diseases. So, um, you know, they, they just, so it was all, it's, it's all this kind of stuff that, um, I mean, I, I know I keep saying it, but propaganda just to kind of uh, paint an image um, for those who don't do a lot of their own research, um, for those who um, are already scared, it just instills into their minds um, what they wanted to believe about it because they it's already something that they are kind of leaning towards believing in. So, um, and it does and me saying it's systematic doesn't justify him doing that. I'm just saying it, it, it honestly just goes back and um, he killed a person, he killed a person, he killed a, killed people. I'm sorry, he killed people, he killed people, he killed people. And that's just what it is. And really, it, it's it's got to be work about um, holding them accountable, regardless of the of the variables. It, it doesn't it shouldn't really matter what the variables are. Often, when POC are in a place where they commit a crime, there are no variables other than their POC, and that's what they do. Um, they should be held accountable, regardless. And we got to recognize that this isn't just something that has just popped up. Especially, like I said, it shouldn't have been a conversation that was sparked uh, because people died. Um, that's really egregious in and of itself, where it's not, we don't talk about something until something uh, devastating happens. Um, and it, we just got to talk about the history and how, how far this really goes back and acknowledging that and acknowledging that it's something that's really just been ingrained into so many of us so we can start to unlearn these behaviors and these thought processes. Like most definitely, like, uh, I, th I think that's, that's also like a big problem that, that happens, even when it doesn't like involve us, the fetishization of, of a culture will always be like deeply enrooted. Like you, you don't like the people, but you like their, you like their food or you like their clothes, you like their style, you like to see them, but you, you don't want to be like, consist yourself around them or be around them in general. There were wars that were happening in, um, like, even like, if I think back, uh, just from, I don't, I don't read articles sometimes only because I hate the word, like allegedly it gets placed in the wrong places of like this person who, who did this, uh, said this allegedly he has a mental, like, I don't like words like that just in general, but like when, like, for example, even in the U S when, uh, when like there were, there was inner fighting in a, on like the con not the continent i think it's the continent of asia but there was inner fighting between country asian countries there would be propaganda or just talkings of it here that had nothing to do with us we weren't even trading with them at the time or just at all it'd be like oh look at them like fighting over there and it's really ignorant as well but it's also like it's always just to just to not in you want to feel like I feel like at times it's, it's a feeling of inclusion, like like sometimes they're like a huge kid that wants to be like, I want a pot. I want my hand in like everything that's, that's stupid. It's not like uh, you have to be included in everything. And it's it's also just has to you don't have to always throw your like two cents in of, hey, I feel like this is going on or this is going on here. And it, it's happened way more times than like right now, which is more as Em was saying earlier, we have like our phones now and it's it's a possibility to like report things and talk to people about things absolutely so with that um i want to toss it over to em and em is going to talk more about uh or what em is going to introduce us to if we don't know about it um the model minority myth hey y'all so um, just throwing it back to like how, so how systemic this really is and systematic, um, how history does play a part into all of this Asian hate. It's not just coming up out of nowhere. Um, and so like, um, Shane was talking about before, like with the Chinese Exclusion Act. So that was created in 1882. 
um, when Chinese immigrants came over to the United States for work, um, non-immigrants, so um, a lot of white people uh, referred to these Chinese immigrants as yellow peril um, because they were seen as unfit to be citizens and too uncivilized to be citizens. And then that's how this um, law uh, came to be about excluding, ex excluding, oh my gosh, I can't speak. Excluding um, Chinese immigrants from entering the US. Um, and then in World War II, this whole model minority idea gained popularity. So in 1882, they were um, too uncivilized. And then now this model minority is civilized and they are the model for all other minorities and people of color um, because they are hardworking. They have proved themselves, even though the US didn't want them here, Asian people are now very civilized, they're very hardworking, um, they're very successful, and specifically Black people need to be like Asian people in the U.S. Um, so this is this myth was created um, to basically drive a wedge between Asian and Black communities, um, to pin them against each other, um, and that also just that has created long lasting effects um, for the black community as well as the AAPI community. Um, and this model minority includes things like being successful, like I said, but also being very smart. So naturally good at math, um, wealthy, um, hardworking as, and also they're like the ideal, um, the ideal result for the American dream. Like these are the people that are truly living the American dream. Um, so I want to throw it over to Naima or Ashanti to talk more about Asian Black solidarity. Yes. Um, Asian Black solidarity, it's everywhere really, um, but not enough. And I feel like uh, I've really research I've re researched a lot of uh, conversations that include the discourse between the two um, and the like uh, Em was saying um, how it's stereotyped that you know black people should be more like Asian people or um, for, to promoting to, to Asians that like oh black people are the like minority that you don't want to mess with don't want to talk to like they we are we have been unified We've been unified since um, the uh, mass immigration from Asia to America, um, and the after the slavery, because um, a lot of uh, people needed to replace workers, and often, often they were Asian workers. Um, I read many articles on. Um, I just don't want to get it wrong. Many articles on railroads built to um, go out west in order to um, for uh, to promote gold. And after the gold rush was uh, declining, um, people needed ways to get out west in order to you know search for gold and things like that. And a lot of times they use railroads. Well, they this was like the big thing the train railroads. Um, and to build those, they didn't have slaves anymore because um, they put them all in prisons so they could become slaves again. So in this, there was no little process going on. And now we have to get workers so to wait on this process. And often they were Asian workers, very much often. And we've been in this kind of battle for equality, for unity since then. And even today with um, there's this uh like uh movements like um Asians for Asians for Asians for blacks or for Asians for black lives I'm sorry um or uh dumplings for unity which is which are two very recent movements uh dumplings for unity was a fundraiser uh to raise money to uh combat 
you know, Asian disparities in America. And basically what they did were, uh, like, there's like a cookout online and they teach people how to make dumplings. And it was very unifying. And um, uh, it's just a lot of, a lot of uh, examples of Asians and Blacks being unified, but this narrative that we aren't is being pushed so heavy because people know the people who are pushing this narrative, they know if we were to acknowledge our unification, they know that we, are, we aren't unified in many aspects. And if we get fully unified, that we will be that much closer to equality and they're not especially more for all equal. If we all raise our, our you know, economy, our, uh, it's not the same because they don't feel the hierarchy anymore. And that's, that's in general what I gotta say. Anyone have any questions or concerns or comments? There's a um, there's a documentary called Far East, Far East, Far East, Deep South. Sorry, it's a documentary about Chinese American communities living in the Deep South. It's on PBS and it's from the Southeast Asian Dysphoria Project. I think it's very interesting. Um, I think it's on PBS or some type of thing like that. It's, it's really good, Yash. Sorry, um, Naima, is there a, a mutation problem? No, that's wrong. You're muted. You're muted. Was I muted the whole time? No, you weren't, but like the last 10 seconds you were. I hate it here. What did y'all hear? What we, was the last yeah. part? We heard that. Uh, yeah, we we heard that you had the. Uh, <laughs> uh, you had there was the the documentary, um, and then you were saying it's either on PBS or something along those lines. Um, and if can you just repeat the name of the uh, documentary one more time? Yeah, it's called, called Far East, Deep South. Um, it's a it's a website. It's fareastdeepsouth.com. I'm pretty sure um, y'all can find way more information than I told y'all on there. Um, it's a lot of podcasts, it's resources on there. So very, yes. Thank you, Naima. Um, yeah, uh, Ashanti already kind of spoke on it. Um, I just want to emphasize this idea of um, they the push to keep us, you know, uh, in conflict with each other, um, whether that be uh, like within our own race or in between races, um, because of the fact that if we ha if we find unity, um, then we are no longer the minorities um, and they are scared of that switch of power. And they're scared of no longer, like Ashanti said, having that hierarchy over us or having that unspoken um, power, if you will, over us. Um, and um, that's a really powerful thing to understand. And, and if that's it, I, I, I would just encourage you all to had that be something you guys really process and think about and how really uh, how really vital that could be um, in just making sure we always recognize our unity, even when it's pushed on us that there is none or that we, you know, have hate for each other or we dislike each other for this, that, and the third. But ultimately, if you know your hearts are hearts and we all for the same cause and we all want the same thing um, as powers and numbers. And it's a lot more of us than it is of them. 
And we just got to stay strong and stay vigilant and stay resilient about that. Um, I, I just think that's super, that's a super powerful fact. I would like to say there's, there's a lot of discourse between um, Asians and Blacks that is exactly that discourse and invalid. Um, often I hear, even in my own community, in my own community, I hear when, when me and my brothers, we uh, are very, we don't acknowledge like Asian people are Asian people, they're POC is a people of cover, color. And often, even when I'm talking to um, older uh, black people, I'm like my, like my parents or my uncle or things of that nature. Um, and we're trying to acknowledge that, uh, that Asian people have these prejudice against them because they don't look like white people, but they also have the lighter skin. And it's easy for, like I said, uh, older generations of black people to say, oh yeah, Asian people are white people, which is innately just discourse in the mind. So there's this narrative that if you have lighter skin, that you are white, right? So, and I feel like black people in America have like been put through so much trauma that we, we can't differentiate like people of color. And also there are times where I hear many Asian people say they're not POC because they have lighter skin, right? And that they're not in this, um, in this minority and are, don't wanna acknowledge their oppression through that. And I would like to say the Asian experience in America and the black experience in America are unique and should never be compared. Um, there are comparisons, and obviously there are, um, with lighter skin, you are accepted more by, what, uh, by more people, but they're different. And can, if we find the similarities between the two, it will be much easier to dis demolish this discourse, right? Um, get it out because, like I said, like, it tracks back, because like I previously said, because if we're unified, then we're strong stronger together than we are apart. And we can make these steps by just calling out friends and family on promoting this. And I know we're young people and it's so easy to, you're young and you don't know anything like <laughs> gaslight us. And I know it's like, it's so frustrating because like I, like I literally, it's a situation I literally said, I'm like, um, I, I was watching my brother talk to his mother and um, he was, I guess he was talking about his football coach and his mother asked if the dude was white and he was like, no, nah, he's an Asian dude. He was like, they're white. And then like, it's so easy to be shut down by these people, but you have to be strong. And we, like I said, the, the stronger we are to our loved ones, the more we point things out, the more we can change the problems within our community, the more we can, the better we can reach out to other communities and, change the similarity, similar problems that we have. Even when gaslighting is so prevalent. <laughs> For sure. Um, and that's really dope what you said, um, just about like, it, it feels like POC are put in a position where we're supposed to pit our traumas against each other. Um, and it's like, Oh well, you didn't go through this, so your trauma is not as you know you you know you you didn't experience as much as I did, so you don't even need to be complaining about this, or you know what I mean. And that's something that I think I got caught up in for a little while, um, and that's I mean that I that's that's super toxic in and of itself. I guess like comparing traumas and trying to see who's had who's had it worse. Um, it's a, it's just a really weird concept looking back at it, but it, it was ingrained into me. Like, and it was stuff that I heard, you know, um, you know, other, other people, other people had it bad and this, that, and the third happened to them, but you know, we were slaves and this happened to us and this happened to us. And instead of acknowledging that there are, that both parties experience trauma 
It's um, who had it worse. And that's who we should be focusing on as opposed to we should be acknowledging everybody's traumas and trying to fight them all at once. Even though that seems like a harder task, um, I think that's something that's that's essential. Um, so I, I, just like, I just like what you said about that, Ashanti. Thank you. Yeah, and I was just gonna say like, that's what the oppressors want. Like they want us to be mad at each other and they want us to compare our different and our different like experiences. And it's not even like the black community versus the Asian community because everyone's experience is different. Um, not one age, like I don't speak for the entirety of the Asian community um, and no one else can do that. Um, it's just individualized experiences. Um, and like speaking of experiences, I just want to touch on my own, like during the, the worst parts of the pandemic and thank God that it's, it's looking like we can cut, we can stop this. Um, please get vaccinated. Anyways. I just got my uh, second one today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, just during like the worst parts of the pandemic, I was an essential worker and I was so scared every time I went into work that some white guy was going to come cough in my face um, call me slurs or anything like that because that's everything that was happening in that in the news. Um, I've and even like past, even when the pandemic has been getting better and everything like that, there are still people getting coughed on by white people, and um, it's like referred to as the Chinese virus and everything like that. Um, so keeping that in mind, like now that the pandemic is slowly, slowly coming to an end, please be safe out there. Um, just try to talk to your family. Like I know so many like of my peers who has, they have like racist families. And if you feel like you can do nothing um, in terms of like Asian hate and like being an, an activist, um, start with what you know. Like if your parents, if anyone in your family is spewing like terrible lies about anyone, people of color, um, then just like start there. Like that's what you can do, then do that. Um, Cause it can start, activism starts within your community. Um, you don't need to be like at the forefront of some movement. It can literally start at like a dinner conversation. Um, so I really urge everyone to do what they can and no act is too small. Oh, most definitely, most definitely. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I um I don't it's it's very difficult at times to talk to family, but it, it's more definitely you should start in your inner circle. And even within that, like the smallest things can do, like share resources or like even for or show up for rallies, especially as well, because it's it's a lot of times where uh people want to join together and speak out against stuff like this or in general, but it's not like you know exactly how to do it or people have the resources to do so sharing stuff like that is cool or like if you know hotlines or uh places that are specifically helping other communities then by all means please share it with people as much as possible everyone has a phone nowadays um yeah i was gonna say i had um which i didn't know recently i was gonna throw it out there but michigan uh now i think by like march april no april 25th i believe they have a, um a hotline that they made for uh asian hate or asian for to report asian hate crimes that they, i think they're they're now getting uh not translators but people who can understand other languages just in case it's not uh all english which i don't know it's great i think it's i think it's a good thing it's just uh hopefully it, it uh, more people are aware of the, of the situation and know how to access it. I would like to also hop on what you said, uh, Malik, about sharing uh, ways we can better help the Asian community and our community itself. And in general, uh, also you gotta look for, you know, share, but also look for if no one finds it, then it's not put out right? And then we can share it. So we have to be proactive in that way as well. As soon as we stop, then 
Everyone, if someone stops looking for it, then no one puts anything out. Which is true, which is true. You should be proactive, man. Even like small ways. Like M, M shared the place. I low-key do. I like noodles a lot. But M shared the place uh, earlier, the land city. I'm going to go there for it because I drive on Washington. But like support Asian brands as well. Support uh, POC brands in general. Shop POC. Go go eat at POC-owned businesses. It's good for you. I promise. Um, but support businesses such as that. But also like talk to people for real. Like if you have friends that... uh that like, you know, that that not that you haven't spoke within a minute or, you know, that maybe everything is going to like it might just affect them. Talk to people, you know, talk to people around you. If you know someone's like, hey, my friends like my friends like Filipinos. Like, all right, cool. Can you talk to your friend? Make sure they're OK. Check in with everybody, because even quarantine made a lot of people uh, make tension, not tension high, but it, it also caused its own problems. Yeah, for sure. Um... You know, I think the biggest thing to accept with this and all kind of talks around this as well as other harder subject matters is that it's going to be uncomfortable. And often it is uncomfortable, especially with it's, when it's with your own family um, and it is in your inner circle because you're scared of losing those relationships. Um, and just the reality is a lot of growth, for, it comes from making yourself uncomfortable and putting yourself in uncomfortable situations. Not that you should uh, put your mental health at risk or anything or your physical health at risk, but um, in order to grow, you have to uh, break things down. Um, that's how I sound like, I sound like, I don't know, like a, uh, like a coach or something you gotta you gotta break down the muscle to build it up you know what i mean um but just just in that sense like you gotta you gotta do things that are hard and that um are going to challenge you in order to in order to evolve past that point so um and i i would like to shout out everybody who was here today and shout out um you know, like we say, you know, acknowledge it when you can. If you see it, say something that's for anything um, that's for anything that might look harmful, even if it, even if it looks a little suspicious. If you have some suspicions, um, I think it's still OK to report every to report things, um, you know, keep in mind um, how you're speaking up. And, and even though even though you may want to help out, do not put um, your efforts or your education on the shoulders of your uh, POC friends. Um, it is it is your job and responsibility as other as POC allies and just allies period to each other um, to be unified in knowing our information and educating ourselves so we can so we can acknowledge and, and be there for anybody. Um, and uh, you know just, just make sure um, you know educate yourself. Do take some training courses in hate. Um, in certain like hate crimes or like what hate looks like um, in different areas or facets. Um, there's, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different um, opportunities for you to um, educate yourself and grow. So, um, you know, really just, it's no excuses. It's going to be hard. It can be tough, but it's for, a good cause and it's for everyone to be happy at the end of the day and if that's not what you want at your core then we're gonna have to have a talk you know what i'm saying go get a therapist i don't know i don't know to, i don't know what to tell you you know what i'm saying you should be you should be happy for hoping for everyone's happiness um but thank you all so much for being here today this was fantastic um and uh I want to close us out. Um, I'm going to pass it to Ciara. Okay, right okay. All right. So the close out this episode, I'm going to have Naima read a poem from Wang Ping, who is a um, Chinese-born poet. And before I read her bio, I'm going to shout out Carlina one of our teaching assistants and she has a new book 
that was recently released called Alien Miss, which is another good resource for learning more about the Chinese Ex Exclusion Act. And I just want you guys to know that it's out there. You can read it. Okay. Um, so the poem is Things We Carry on the Sea by Wang Ping. And she was born on August 14th, 1957 in Shanghai, China during the Cultural Revolution. Um, she received her BA in English literature from Beijing University in 1984 and immigrated to the US in 1985. And it was at Long Island U University where she walked into a creative writing class. And that's when she started writing poetry. And currently she is a associate professor at the McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. So take it away, Naima. All right. We carry tears in our eyes. Goodbye, father. Goodbye, mother. We carry soil in small bags. May home never fade in our hearts. We carry names, stories, memories of our villages, fields, boats. We carry scars from proxy wars of greed. We carry carnage of mining, droughts, floods, genocide. We carry dust of our neighborhoods incinerated in mushroom clouds. We carry our islands sinking under the sea. We carry our hands, feet, bones, hearts, and best minds for a new life. We carry diplomas, medicine, engineer, nurse, education, math, poetry, even if they mean nothing to the other shore. We carry railroads, plantations, long mats, bodega, taco trucks, farms, factories, nursing homes, hospitals, schools, temples, built on our ancestors' backs. We carry old homes along the spine, new dreams in our chests. We carry yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We're orphans of the wars forced upon us. We're refugees of the sea rising from industrial waste. And we carry our mother's tongues. I hub lead a more love. Ping on salam, shalom, paz, peace, a mall, hope, hope, hope. As we drift in our rubber boats from shore to shore to shore. Thank you, Naima, that was beautiful. Uh, thank you so much. And shout out to the poet as well. Shout out to Malik, shout out to Elm, shout out to Ashanti, shout out to Siata, shout out to Naima for all being here today and representing. Shout out to everybody who couldn't make it today. I know they wanted to be here in spirit. You know, everybody got their own things going on and that's okay. Um, we think this is important and it's not gonna stop with this podcast. Again, we just wanted to, spark a conversation if you hadn't already um but y'all know what this is it's stay in power um i've had a beautiful time with everybody here i'm enjoying y'all thank y'all for tuning in thank y'all for tuning in to our future episodes thank y'all for following all of us on social media when you get the chance you know what i'm saying uh, we know we all trying to go we all trying to be artists we all trying to be great so just su support us uh support your peers support your colleagues support poc support poc support poc and with that we out